have a Constitution display and a 9-11 display, and we have Judge Cunningham's books up there, so please feel free to check that out before you leave. Uh, we have refreshments. I know some of you have already helped yourselves, but please get more if you need it. Uh, feel free to get, get up if you need to in the presentation and get some more and help yourself. Thank you for coming, and uh, we are so happy that Student Government Association has helped sponsor this event today, and I am pleased to introduce Mr. Gavin Posey, who is the president of the Student Government Association. Gavin? Hey, everybody. I'd like to thank you all for coming here to hear the Honorable Judge Bill Cunningham of the Kentucky Supreme Court discuss the U.S. Constitution and how it relates to today's society. Justice Cunningham's impressive record of service includes Captain of the U.S. Army serving in Germany, Korea, and Vietnam, Circuit Court Judge of the 56th Judicial District, Commonwealth's Attorney of the 56th Judicial District, City Attorney of Eddyville, public defender for the Kentucky State Penitentiary, and hearing officer for the Kentucky Board of Claims. You may also be familiar with Justice Cunningham's literature as he's the author of six books. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Justice Bill Cunningham. I had one of these at, uh, oh, there we go. I wore one of these at uh, giving a speech at a church one day, and I forgot to take it off. I was back in the back, and I was talking away, and everybody in the church was hearing it. Fortunately, I didn't go to the restroom or anything, so. Um, Constitution of the United States. Uh, it's what I've been required to talk about. Usually when I'm required to talk about things like that, our Supreme Court, People's eyes begin to glaze over. Uh, they start checking their watch, and they start looking to see if they can be seated close to the back so they can make an easy exit. But um, the Constitution of the United States is, is something that is really very special, and I recognize it, and I appreciate you recognizing it. You know, I've got raised five children, and I've been around teenagers and, and um, uh, young people. Two of the most overused words in the English vocabulary, at least here in West Kentucky, is awesome and miracle. Oh, Tommy came over and took me for a motorcycle ride yesterday. Oh, that's awesome. Well, no, it's not really awesome. There's thousands and thousands of people out there riding motorcycles. Oh, Cardinals won three to two last night in 10 innings. That's awesome. Oh, no, the Cardinals have won a few more games than last night, and uh, it's not awesome. The eclipse the other day, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I'll try to be a little bit uh, sparingly how I use that word. The other, the other word that's overused is miracle. The Cardinals rallied from 10 down to win last night and made a miraculous recovery. No, it wasn't miraculous. They went out there and got more hits, got more runs, and they got made a heroic comeback. And I miraculously passed algebra. No, it wasn't miraculous. The, the algebra teacher just gave you the grade. There's no divine intervention there. Miracle, miraculous, awesome. Miracles don't come along that often. And it's not that much unless you consider life itself and everything that follows up to that as being awesome. Uh, I guess it's a pretty good attitude to have. So with that in mind, when I picked up uh, Catherine Brinker Bowen's book, Miracle at Philadelphia, I thought, uh-oh, here we go, a miracle at Philadelphia. And I knew I was going to be reading about the U.S. Constitution. Well, I knew it was going to be a hyperbole. It wasn't any really miracle. A lot of men got together up there, and they wrote a Constitution, and we're still working on that Constitution today. 
it was it was man-made and it was uh, people who got together and used their heads it wasn't enough, it wasn't anything miraculous about it I started reading that amazing story and I recommend it highly the miracle at Philadelphia by Catherine Brinker Brown it's very readable very interesting and when now you start out and you read that book by the time I was finished you know I thought maybe this was a miracle Maybe our Constitution came pretty close to that because it is absolutely incredible when we go back through the tunnel of time. I want to do that. You go back through the tunnel of time to that day and age in the summer of 1787 from May until September. And you consider what those men, and it was all men, it would probably got it done quicker, probably been better had we had women, but we didn't. It's all men. Uh, by the way, I, during my lifetime, you can tell I've been around a while, we've had great influx of women lawyers in West Kentucky. When I start, first started practicing law, there were few. And now we've got about 40, 50 percent. I can tell you that our uh, legal profession has been greatly enhanced. Women have great skills to be lawyers. Uh, I may be a little bit chauvinistic here, and I'm diverting, but... Uh, they have the ability, I guess it came from whatever in their, in their long background, to multitasking and attention to detail. Boy, that makes good lawyers. So I threw that, threw that little ad in for you, you women here today. Uh, there weren't any women there. We might have got it done quicker. We might have got a better constitution, but we didn't. I want you to consider this country at that time. The largest city in the United States at that time was only 43,000 people. I want you to think of that eastern seaboard, going down the eastern seaboard. Most everything else inland was really uh, undeveloped. There were settlements out here. There were towns out here, but they were few and far between. It was a frontier. When you got west of uh, the Appalachian Mountains in this country, you were in really wilderness. And even on the eastern seaboard, the towns were small. The largest city in the United States at that time was Philadelphia, uh, 43,000 people. The huge megapolis of New York City that we know today was 33,000, about the size of Paducah in 1787. Boston was 18,000 people. Baltimore was 12,000, about like Benton. Um, I say that to say there weren't many big cities, and when towns and metropolitans were that small, you think about the mode of travel, at that time, horseback, uh, there were no trains, uh, there were no motor cars, it was all horseback, wagons, buggies, mostly horseback, as these men from 13 states came together in Philadelphia, 13 states that went all the way from Maine to Florida, over 1,500 miles going through different climates, going through different cultures, going through different uh, uh, economic uh, environments, that they all made it to Philadelphia at one time uh, is a miracle. I've got, um, as I said, I've got five grown sons, and one of my sons has become obsessed with he and his four brothers and me taking a hike by ourselves, no wife, no children, just us six people going to take a hike for three days, sleeping on the ground over in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I said, Alex, you get all those brothers, they live in their four different states, his family. I said, you get four people, four brother, four year brothers there on a weekend, I'll go. He did it. Now I gotta go. It's coming up in about two weeks. And the fact he got all of them there coming to Asheville, North Carolina. I thought that was something. What if he had to get all these delegates in Philadelphia in May of 1787 at one time? And you know, it was probably I have some fellow judges up in northern Kentucky, and I go to judicial conferences with them, Fred. You know people from all over the state. Sometimes I feel like I'm going to need an interpreter to talk to them. So I would imagine that the dialects and, and the accents and things at that time were probably more pronounced, maybe more with a British and English accent, maybe more with a Scottish accent. I don't know. But it, in 1787, the fact they got to Philadelphia in a country like this uh, was remarkable. There were 55 delegates. Uh, they were young. The young people put this Constitution together. In their 20s and 30s, it was 
Benjamin Franklin being the oldest, uh, 81 years of age. He was almost as old as Fred Nestle. 81, Ben Franklin, and the rest of them were in their 20s and 30s. And here were the key three players at that convention. George Washington, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. George Washington, to all accounts, was godlike. I mean, he was just his personality, and they immediately, without a uh, objection, made him president of this convention. That set the tone. When George Washington was sitting up there, everybody behaved themselves, and everybody went on their best behavior. Alexander Hamilton, probably one of the best minds at this convention, and one of the best minds of our founding fathers, philosophically, for a strong central government. But if you were going to name someone who being the father of our Constitution, the father of our bill, the one who probably deserves the most credit of all the people for our Constitution was James Madison. Uh, James Madison, Montpelier, Virginia, I had, a, I had the occasion to go there for a four-day conference where we stayed in separate uh, cottages there is his home and we studied the Bill of Rights. James Madison was one of the driving forces of this Constitution. He was the reporter. He not only was involved in it, but he also was a reporter. He sat there and he, because of James Madison, we have a pretty accurate account of what went on at that convention. And um, he was there reporting it all. You know, we like to think that they got together in Philadelphia in 1787 because they wanted equal rights, that they wanted due process, that they wanted representative government, we wanted a democracy, all these beautiful things we know that has come from those uh, meeting there. But the motivating force for them being there in 1787 was business. It was commerce. Keep in mind now, the Articles of Confederation that they've operated on since their, indep since their independence and winning the Revolutionary War eight years before was a loose confederation of, they called them states, but they're almost a confederation of 13 countries. And think of the commercial problems they ran into, because all of them had their own individual business system, commerce, currency. They even had their own tariffs, and it affected interstate commerce. Think about the control that they had of what the, each state trying to butt head and trying to control the shipment of goods, its currency, all this. In fact, it was, a, it was a conflict between Maryland and Virginia over the navigation of the Potomac River that drove them down to Mount Vernon, represented most two states down to Mount Vernon, to try to work out a, a solution to that problem. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and some of these others were already talking about, we need a new constitution. We need a stronger central government. Alexander Hamilton made a point to attend that meeting in Mount Vernon, and it was there at Mount Vernon that the, the idea of getting them all together and doing a, um, a convention, having a convention, all the delegates from each of these 13 states, and writing a more um, workable constitution, making a stronger government uh, that would make this new government, new democracy work. But it was inspired by commerce, but we know that it came from much, much more. So they sent the call out, and ostensibly, it wasn't for the writing of a new constitution. It, because there was paranoia in that country, in this country at that time. It's kind of hard for us to envision. Think of yourself as being under a monarch for centuries, fighting a bloody war and, and, and being able to throw off the manacles imposed by the, the British government. And all of a sudden, you breathe this liberating air of independence the last thing you want to do is be under another strong central government, right? We enjoy being having North Carolina as a state, as our, as our main government. We enjoy having New Jersey. We enjoy having Pennsylvania. So there was a pushback of any idea of us devising a constitution that would provide a strong national government to the point that it would come anywhere close to being like the British crown was. The only person in this congregation was really for something almost like a monarch was Alexander Hamilton. He was for a strong central government. He was for, basically, if Alexander Hamilton had anything to do with it, there would no be no states. But he was practical enough to know that wasn't existent, and they were smart enough to know if they told everybody we're going to go to Philadelphia and write a new constitution, everybody's going to push back and nobody's going to come. We're going to go to Philadelphia and revise, revise the Articles 
of Confederation. So that's how they got people there. Some of the other leaders of that convention were James Wilson. These are people, ladies and gentlemen, that were vital to our history. They didn't go on to become presidents. They didn't go on to become Supreme Court justices. They just kind of faded away after their time had passed. But without them, we wouldn't have the Constitution we have today. They were brilliant men, uh, men of great passion, men of great eloquence, men of great insight, and men of great knowledge of history, Greek philosophy, Roman philosophy, and the great writers of the past. Uh, James Wilson from Pennsylvania, George White of Virginia, John Dickerson of Delaware, Governor Morris from Pennsylvania, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Edmund Randolph of Virginia, Charles Pinckney of South Carolina. And when you read this miracle of Philadelphia, those people are like team players. You know, a good team, a good basketball team, a good baseball team, uh, Coach Chalmer, has chemistry. In order everybody can be stars, you've got to have good chemistry on the team. You may have some player that doesn't score but four or five points, but you may lead the team in assists. You may have some player that doesn't do much on assists or score many points, but he leads in rebound. You'll see that each of these team players would inject certain things at certain times in this great debate. They were, they were, they would, they would meet an impasse. We don't know what to do about this. We don't know what to do about this, how we count slavery. We don't know how to do, what we're gonna do about representation, small states, big states. There was always seemed like a player that came through at the right time and suggested a compromise that got them over that hump. So that's why these people are so important. When they went up there, and this is James Madison, Virginian. Thomas Jefferson now was overseas. He was in France still. Thomas Jefferson had very little to do with this Constitution, uh, except the fact that him and Madison corresponded rapidly. Madison and Jefferson were the same ilk philosophically. But Madison was a Virginian, and the state of Virginia at that time, which was, along with Massachusetts, one of the two largest states in the country, um, had a pretty good system of government. They had a good democratic system. They had a bicameral legislature. They had uh, the makings of what James Madison wanted their country to look like. So you go to a meeting like that, and you go in there with 55 delegates from all over, and you go in there and you sit down and you elect the president, and that's George Washington, then what do you do? I'm looking at the numbers here. We probably got, may have about 55 people in this room, pretty close. All right, we're all together in here. You got a president sitting up there. What do you do next? <coughs> well, James Madison was prescient enough to bring the Virginia <coughs> plan. The Virginia plan was a, something like, you know, you go to a meeting, you say, well, guys, I know this is, I'm a little biased here. This is our idea. These, these are our bylaws, or, or this is the way we do it. But here's the Virginia plan. They latched onto that and worked off of it. Once you can throw something out there to work from, then you begin to take it apart, change it, and that's what they did. The Virginia plan was uh, brought to the convention by Madison, and it was, uh, it was uh, the, the working piece that they worked off of and made it uh, easier to, to, to go from there. Um, as I said before, the real catalyst for this convention was commerce, there were terrible entanglements between states, and uh, they were trying to work out the relationship between states. And as I said also, it keyed off Virginia's uh, tricameral tri government, actually, two chambers in the legislative session, the legislative, the executive, and the um, judicial. Um, kind of interesting, as you read the transcript of that convention, comments were made. George Reed of Delaware wasn't one of the major players, but he made a statement that was pretty fruition. And if we look down through the ages, it's kind of come around. He said, ultimately, they had all these states' rights people there. Ultimately, state authority will be swallowed up by the national government. Now, had those people believed that at that time, they would have all gone home. And that's part of the miracle in Philadelphia. I guarantee you, if every single one, maybe even Alexander Hamilton, or maybe with the exception of Alexander Hamilton, had seen how big and strong and powerful our government, federal government had become today, they'd all gone home. 
I guarantee you, because if you learn the history of uh, what transpired there, it was always and the most important thing on their mind was states' rights. We want to make sure, yes, we need a stronger government. Yes, we need this kind of government. We need to be able to regulate interstate commerce. Yes, we need a strong national defense, and that was a big weakness of the Articles of Confederation. But we don't want to create a strong enough government so we're back under the enslavement like we were the British. So states' rights was always on the table. Um, they had difficulty dealing with representation. You had small states there, you had large states there, and here you had this clash. The, the, the large states, they wanted uh, it all to be uh, represented by population. Small states wanted to be guaranteed a minimum of representatives. This went back and forth, what was fair, what was not fair. And finally, the compromise came out, as you well know it today, each state was the Senate, highest chamber, wanted to declare war. It had certain powers that were given to them. Each state had equal representation in the Senate, two from each state. House of Representatives would be a population. The larger states would have their representatives there. They had different duties, and they had different oversight, and they had different checks and balances. That was a great breakthrough, compromise. Slavery was an issue that was dealt with very gingerly. It was dealt with very gingerly because the southern states would not stay put for slavery being abolished. If we look back on that Constitutional Convention, and a lot of people have written about this, yeah, and, it, and they're criticized for not just taking that opportunity at that Constitutional Convention in 1787 and abolish slavery in the United States, maybe put a grandfather clause when it takes an effect. Why didn't they do that? Well, it would have certainly saved us a lot of grief, wouldn't it? It would have saved us a lot of grief, but it would never got done. It just wasn't going to get done. So if the northern states pushed it, pushed it, and it became a breaking point, the southern states were going home. And interestingly enough, we may have had two countries from the very beginning. Uh, and maybe not avoid a civil war, but they knew that they would be weakened by that, and they were wanting to make sure we kept a United States. So they dealt with it. They didn't make any strong movement to abolish it. Another interesting aspect of it was, though, what, how do you count slaves? This is kind of fascinating to me. How do you count slaves for representation? Now, of course, at that time, for the Southerners, they, the slaves were chattel, they owned property. The Northerners say, no, uh, you can't count them. They can't even vote. Southerners said, well, they're people. No, well, then you got the North. The North didn't want to give them credit for the slaves in their uh, proportionment of population. And the South, of course, wanted it. So you had them arguing from a different standpoint. You had the Southerners arguing that these people are people, which means what? They're not chattel. The Northerners said, no, they're not really people. They are what? Well, I mean, they kind of switched sides in the argument. Big argument, big issue. What happened? A crazy thing happened. You had a, a, a calculation, a cold arithmetic calculation to count them as two-thirds person. That sounds really strange. That sounds without rationale. But it's the only way they got through it. Only way they got through it. Sometimes you just have to get through it. We have a, a little side note here. We have an interesting provision of our state constitution. How many of you here have taken the oath of office in the state of Kentucky? I know Fred Nessler has, others. There's a peculiar part of that oath. What is it? You have to swear you never fought in a duel. I know that I do it. I, uh, so I hereby swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I will be true and faithful to the Constitution of Kentucky, as long as I remain a citizen there, I will do. Furthermore, Father, I swear and confirm that since the adoption of the present Constitution, I, being a citizen of this state, have not fought a duel with deadly weapons, nor have I acted as a second in carrying a challenge to fight a duel with deadly weapons. Nor have I assisted us, uh, helped anybody in fighting a duel duel. I mean, it takes up half the oath. It was once a serious problem, and I use that to get in when I'm swearing people. I get in to say, we laugh about it now, but it was not a laughing matter at one time. So we got problems out here today. We made a thing really serious. Maybe 100 years now, they'll be laughing at that. Bring that up only to point out this. In the 1890 convention, 
they got to that point. What about this oath, guys? This dueling oath. Are we going to keep it in there? I mean, it's a little bit embarrassing. We've got this dueling oath. They haven't been a duel in Kentucky in 40 years. Yeah, but they had one down in Georgia the other day. Somebody say, oh, they did this. Somebody say, well, it seems to be working then. And on and on and on. They spent a lot of, you read the transcript of the Constitutional Convention of 1890. They, they spent a lot of time on it. And then they realized that this is not getting us anywhere. We're wasting a lot of time. We're hung up on this. It's not worth fighting over. Leave it in. So we have it. And then, uh, Fred, I don't know if you were in the house at the time, a few years back, they introduced a bill up there to do away with that part of the oath. Oh, my gosh, there's a general outcry in Kentucky. Radio show call-ins. No, no, no. It's become unique uh, and uh, part of us. Well, dealing with that at that convention, 18 it's kind of like dealing with this slavery issue with representation. They finally got to the point, we got to come to something or everybody's going to start going home. That's where the two-thirds compromise came from. It's irrational, impractical as it may sound, it got them by. The election of an executive. We have the President of the United States. It could have, it could have gone a different way. At one time, I mean, it wasn't always. In fact, there were people at that convention that did not want a one-person executive. Why not? Looked too much like a king. They wanted a committee. At one time, they talked about a three-person executive. They talked about different facets of, of having representation as the executive branch. They finally settled on one. Then they got around to how are we going to select this president. Here's the interesting thing. All of them were against popular election of the president. They all against it. Let's let Congress decide. Let's let Congress elect our president. That almost passed. We could almost today kind of wish it had. We go through every four years. It's going to be nice. We let the Congress decide who's going to be president. They finally came up with a compromise on that. Today, it still gets debated around, well, no, let's put a little buffer. Let's, let's let the states elect people called electors, and they'll be a little more sophisticated than the rabble and the rude, and they'll come and vote for the president. So they said, we'll let the states elect electors. And I know Hamilton them thought he was going to be the well-educated, going to be the affluent. I bet you no one in this room, maybe somebody here, could name one elector who went up to cast the vote for Donald Trump last January. It just has faded into the past where it still requires electoral votes, but that's a remnant of the original founders. <laughs> But now, of course, it is by popular vote. But in the final analysis, uh, Kentucky, can, can whoever they vote for president, um, or the, the, does not, the, you go and you, you vote in Kentucky or any state for a candidate that eventually wins but loses the state, you wasted your vote. Your vote basically doesn't count by the electoral process. But anyway, that was a big issue, and that's how they resolved it. Not having the popular vote, they didn't think, but it re eventually uh, evolved into that. Um, okay, so they get the Constitution, they have the judiciary, they have a, three branches of government, they have checks and balances. They finally um, get a finished product in September. I want you to think about Philadelphia in one of the hottest summers they've ever had in 1787. I want you to think further. They did let the media in there, Josh. <laughs> no media covered it. They locked out the media. There, it was, they had outside vermin and insects that were flying through the windows. They had to close the windows. There was no air conditioning. That's part of the miracle. They shut off the air conditioning in this room and leave us in here for a whole summer. You think we agree with anything? No, it'd be a, a lot of mayhem and murder going on. That's what it would be. But that's the conditions they debated this in. Very rational. Of course, those people were tough. It was a tougher breed of people. But uh, finally, they came up with a finished product. Some of them had already gone home by that time. It required, though, for it to be ratified by nine of 13 states. 
And what was important was that it be ratified by conventions in those states because they were afraid that if they left it up to the legislature, what would happen? Well, the legislature were king, right? You had 13 strong state governments and the legislatures were stronger that the legislature not, not approved giving up some of its power, so they required it be done by convention. Nine out of 13 states were required to ratify. The Constitution itself had been signed by 37 of the 55 members. John Randolph of Virginia did not sign it. He eventually changed his mind and kept campaigning for it. Uh, he went out to the states, and here's where it gets dicey. I mean, it, it, it passed the convention. They got the nine convention to, to support it, but it was close. In Virginia, it passed by only 10 votes. Patrick Henry, one of the strongest voices, most eloquent statesman of his day, was adamantly against it because it put too much power in the federal government. You hear Patrick Henry arguing the other side, you've got your hands full. And he was arguing against it. The Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers were going out, hotly debated, and Virginia barely passed it. And Virginia had not passed it, other states would not pass it. But Virginia and Massachusetts were the key states uh, at that time. It passed it in large part because John Randolph, to his credit, who would not sign it in Philadelphia, became convinced by the arguments at the convention that it was better than what we had, and he voted, ended up being for it, and voted for it. Here's something that was very impressive about the ratification process, and it speaks to us today, and our current politicians should take note. There's a lot of statesmanship here. Once these states ratified the Constitution, the ones like Patrick Henry, the ones who've been adamantly against it and spoke so strongly against it, then began to speak in on its behalf. We were against it. We got it. We've got to make it work. There was statesmanship like that in every state. One of the things and the great, biggest arguments against this Constitution, the one that caused the, the advocates of it the, the most swept, is that the opponents of it wanted a Bill of Rights. We want more protection from the central government. We want the right to jury trial. We don't want kangaroo courts set up by the monarch, or in this case, the president. We don't want our churches being closed down. We don't want to have to pay preachers like we did with the British Crown. We want freedom of religion. We want everybody to be, have, a, have a lawyer. We want these things in the Constitution. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, the Federalists said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't bog down this Constitution and all these details. There's no possible for us to be able to list all the rights we want our people to have. We put in this Constitution what powers the federal government has, and that's it. You don't need these Bill of Rights. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Yes, we, that became a big battle front, and that's one reason why the vote was so close in Virginia. Uh, there were those who were wanting a Bill of Rights, especially a, a Bill of Rights that would protect people's freedom of religion. It's, um, it's really fascinating, and it's hard to believe that uh, freedom of religion in this country under the British Crown wasn't that strong because everybody had to belong to the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and, the, and they paid with your tax money the preachers for the Church of England. And many people came here from across the sea because they were persecuted in England. What do they do when they get here? They get persecuted again. And that leads into this group that was so adamant about wanting to have a Bill of Rights. Well, they didn't get the Bill of Rights in the original Constitution. But when James Madison was going around campaigning to be a delegate to the convention, he ran to John Leland. John Leland was, I guess, the Billy Graham of his day. He was a, he was a strong Baptist preacher. He was from Massachusetts, but he had moved to, to Virginia. And he had led the Baptist movement to try to establish freedom of religion in this country, keep state out of our churches. And he met with Madison, and they became good friends. And James Madison finally said, okay, guys, you Baptists. How many Baptists we have here today? Yeah, I'm one of them. This gets really ironic. 
He said, if you Baptists, and they were strong. See, they'd gone back to Roger Williams up in Rhode Island. He came to Rhode Island and established Providence, Rhode Island. Roger Williams then had the first Baptist church, and he started getting persecuted by the British Crown. He had to leave Rhode Island and go to Pennsylvania, which is much more leaner. In the 17th centuries, the Baptists in this state, uh, in this country, were persecuted as bad or worse than the Catholics or the Jews. So at one time, they were highly persecuted uh, uh, of uh, religion. Now, why? Because here's what we believed then and what I personally believe today. They were against infant baptism. They were against church being involved with the state and the state telling you what to do. And they were for the priesthood of the believer. Any Baptist here who's never heard that term, priesthood of the believer, you, know, you may see if you're going to the Baptist church. That means we don't have any popes, we don't have any bishops, we don't have any kings. Every member of our church is the same. They interpret the Bible the way their conscience interprets the Bible. That was their three tenets, the Baptist church, and that didn't set real well, the British crown, and they didn't want to go through that hard experience again. They wanted a bill of rights, separation, church and state, that the state cannot come in and dictate. So John Leland said, okay, James, we're going to send you this convention, and we'll ratify this, but we want your word. You're going to go back, and you're going to get those bills of rights passed, or we're not going to support you. Well, he went to the convention. It was ratified, and then James Madison has to come back and be elected again. What's he being elected for this time in Virginia? Congressman of the new government, the very first congressman from his district in Virginia. He needed the Baptist bad, and once again, he made his commitment. You guys elect me, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a Bill of Rights, and number one on that list, although it was primarily number one as far as the religious groups and Baptists, it really wasn't the number one that the general population of the United States wanted. You know what the general population of the United States wanted? It's just number one priority in that Bill of Rights? No, no, it wasn't the Second Amendment, guys. The Tenth Amendment. They wanted to make sure their state's rights would be appreciated and respected, but it ends up being the 10th Amendment instead of the 1st Amendment because James Madison drew him up and he wanted to take care of his Baptist friends. So, true to his word, and, and, and each state had these same concerns. It just wasn't Virginia. In fact, there was one state, I think it may have been Maryland, that said, okay, we're going to pass this Constitution on the condition that's followed up with the Bill of Rights. So all of them, really, I think maybe even Hamilton were true to the word. You get the Constitution, then we're going to go back, and do what we said we'd do. We're going to give these people a bill of rights. Now, Madison was wise enough to know, too, if we didn't give them the bill of rights, I'm not talking about just the Baptists in Virginia, but we don't give them the bill of rights throughout this country, they're not going to be very strong supporters of this Constitution. Let's placate these people. Let's make them happy. We give them the Bill of Rights, then everybody's going to be aboard and we can go forward with this new country of ours. So the very practical, not only the, the religious aspect of it, but the very practical and political aspect of that. So they passed, um, they drew up the Ten Amendments, and you know, it didn't have to be 10, it could have been 20, it could have been 18, it could have been four, it could have been a lot of different ones, but they finally honed it down to the Ten Amendments that we have today. And uh, everybody knows it. I know all of you know it by heart, right? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's called the Establishment Clause. That's the clause that the U.S. Supreme Court down through the years has taken down Ten Commandments from classrooms because you're establishing a religion in your school. The state money is going into supporting this religion. That's the establishment cause. Respect and establishment of religion are prohibiting in the free exercise thereof. That's the free exercise clause that allows you, to, no matter how crazy uh, your religion may be, you have the right to, to exercise that as long as it doesn't harm other people. And that's when we get into the snake handling cases. And that's when we get into Scientology uh, cases where small children are denied medical care. That gets really dicey, as you know, for our Sierra Supreme Court to, to recognize this freedom of religion, but at the same time, um, it has its limits when it comes to people being injured by it. 
freedom of speech, of course, is also in the First Amendment, but the very first sentence out of the, out of the box on our Bill of Rights has to do with that amendment that the Baptist got passed through James Madison. You know, interestingly, all states have their own constitution, and um, we have our own constitution. I'm going to talk about in just a minute, then we'll finish up. We're going to open it up for questions. Um, I've already gone about the tenets of the Baptist faith. So let's, let's jump forward now. We finished the Constitution. We got the Ten Amendments passed. We know what they are, due process and all that comes later with the 14th Amendment. We jump forward. All the interpretations have been given that. We jump forward to 2010 here in Kentucky when the Kentucky legislature, um, the Kentucky legislature authorized $10 million to build a pharmacy school at the University of the Cumberland down in Whitesburg, Whitesburg not Whitesburg, in um, Williamsburg, Kentucky. That is a Baptist school. Now think about this. Think about John Leland. Think about all those early Baptists. Think about James Madison. Think about the persecution. Think about Roger Williams. These guys would have been turning over in their grave. What the state's going to pay for a pharmacy school on our school, at our college? No way. But that's what the legislature did. They also authorized a million dollars to go into scholarships on that campus. Well, it passed, and as you can imagine, the taxpayers brought a lawsuit. It made up to our Supreme Court. Actually, it's 2010 is when it got to us. The legislature came earlier. That was almost a no-brainer for us. Listen to this. Forget about the U.S. Constitution. Section 5 of our state constitution says, No preference shall ever be given by law to any religious sect, society, or denomination nor to any particular creed, mode, or worship, or system of ecclesiastical polity. I won't read the rest of that amendment. That right there tells you, whoa, wait a minute. We're taking taxpayers' money and giving it to a, a all-religious denominational college. But then we did it even better. We went one better in Section 189. Listen to this. No portion of any fund are tax now existing or that may hereafter be raised or levied for educational purposes shall be appropriated or used by or in the aid of any church. You know, I think that that was a, a when that legislation was passed, it was political. And people were probably afraid, I'm not going to vote against God, I'm not going to vote against the Baptists, I'm going to vote against putting the school. And I think that many of those legislators, we can talk to Fred about this later, many of those legislators thought, this ain't going to cut it. This is not going to meet Constitution muster. And I'm going to tell you something in all candor. We get a lot of those cases. We're on the second floor at the Capitol. Governor's on the first floor. The legislature's on the third floor. We get some of the legislation that comes through, and Fred Nestor is an exception. Good legislator, a good friend of mine. So I may want to accept him out of here. But sometimes I thought, they got these issues on their hands up there in the House or the Senate, and they say, oh, well, let's just pass this thing. Those boys down on the second floor will take care of it. And they come out there, and they take this big bucket of unconstitutional legislation, and they just dump it right down on the second floor on us. But this is one of those laws, I think. I really believe it. Because really, when we made this decision, when we, it was unanimous, when we came out with it, I don't think it really surprised anybody. I really believe that many people in this state and I'm talking about Baptists, we're happy. Because as I said, and I handed out, Justice Hughes wrote that opinion, <laughs> holding it was, un, it, was, it was unconstitutional, a uh, violation of Section 189 and Section 10 of our Constitution, not to mention the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And uh, she wrote that, did a great job with it. I felt like that the court needs some protection from being accused of being anti-religion and being anti-Baptist. So I wrote a concurring opinion, which you have copies of. You get a chance, uh, you read it. It goes more in detail of the history of our separation of church in this state, of the history of how critical it is, how important it is, where it came from, 
Ironically, it was the Baptists that were the great catalyst uh, for this. And you know, many religious sects today still want the Ten Commandments on the wall. Many religious sects today probably still want federal or state money to go into their individual religious university, but it's contrary. It's contrary to the original tenets of the Baptist faith, and it's contrary to the United States Constitution and the Kentucky Constitution. We cover it big time. The Kentucky Constitution is interesting and people forget about it, but we look at it very closely. There's several of us on this court that really put a lot of interest in our Constitution because we think that's one nearest the people. And what we found, the freedom of separation of church and state, the state Constitution deals with it twice. The U.S. Constitution deals with it once. What does that tell you? We thought it was more important than the founders of the Bill of Rights did. There's another section of the state constitution, the U.S. Constitution never mentioned. You know what that is? <coughs> Separation of powers. Separation of powers has evolved through the U.S. Supreme Court decisions, but the U.S. Constitution says nothing about separation of powers. Our Constitution has two different sections, and it, it stresses how important that is. So you'll probably see, because of our state constitution, a lot of times We'll say the legislature has embarked or has, has impeded the executive branch, or we'll say the executive branch has impeded the legislative branch. We see a lot of that allegation going on now with the litigation between Governor Bevin and Attorney General Bashir. Basically, allegations that the executive branch has gone over the. Well, we have two provisions in our state constitution which uh, emphasizes this, this separation of powers, and consequently, we might find something of separation of power here in Kentucky. They might not find it in Tennessee under their constitution. There's a greater emphasis uh, for it here. So when I gave um, the topic uh, for my little talk here today, I'm a born-again constitutional Baptist. I am a born-again constitutional Baptist. And uh, it's a great irony, I think, is because that's been such an important part of our faith and we have such a strong movement by many denominations, not just Baptists, to kind of uh, back up on that and allow state encroachment into our denominations and to our religion. If you read that concurring opinion that I wrote, spent a lot of time, did a lot of research, I had some assistance from that from Dr. Harold Greenfield of Princeton, Kentucky dear friend of mine and former president of Kentucky Baptist Association. And Harold provided me a lot of research for that. Harold did a lot of counseling for me when I was circuit judge, dear friend. I called him the prime minister of the 56th Judicial Circuit. Now I call him the prime minister of the first Supreme Court district. But he, he helped me research the history and it's a fascinating history that we have. A lot of it I didn't even know about the Baptist faith. And one of the most telling things about our great country, no other country in this world does religion thrive like it does here. You think about that. There's no other country that has all the, the, the kaleidoscope of faith in different denominations. There's about 75 different denomin Protestant denominations, uh, including and, and Catholic. And, and, and I'm not talking about even talking about Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim. I'm talking about Protestant denominated about 73 of those. I put that in my opinion according to the U.S. Census. And who knows how many more there are that don't pick up on the census. There's a little church up in uh, Grayson County. I cut through there sometimes coming home to go to Edmondson County and to Butler County. It's just a little cinder block church out there on the side of the road. It's called Nothing Fancy Baptist Church. I love it. I love it. Think of it, how wonderful it is to have people who have the right to go out there and start nothing fancy Baptist church. And you know what? Here's the wonderful part about it. You've got the St. Patrick Cathedral in downtown New York. It spires, reaches into the heavens. That little old nothing fancy Baptist church, nothing fancy Baptist church there in Grayson County has the same protection as all those billionaires up there in New York City. And then two, I believe, have the same claim, equal claim to ecclesiastical purity as they do. Everybody has 
that priesthood of the believer. At least that's what we believe as Baptists. Uh, I've talked too long. I thank you for your attention. Uh, I think we've got, Amy, we've got some time for questions here. I would ask if you do have a question, give me time to get over there. We would like you to speak in the microphone so everyone can hear. Take your shot. Uh-oh. Don't give that mic to Fred Nestler. Uh, Justice Cunningham, you mentioned uh, briefly due process. Do you think that uh, social, me social, social media or media in general has any effect in uh, uh, eroding due process? Social media, the question was, does, uh, do I think that the social media has in effect eroded due process? Um, I'm not sure I know how. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. We got a newspaper. We got Josh here. Take this back to, to Steve Wilson asking this question. I've never understood why we put the picture of people who have been charged with a crime in the newspaper, unless they're a fugitive. Uh, I won't put you on the spot. But, yeah, I mean, I, I got sued one time um, by a circuit judge by the Courier Journal, Josh. I had a death penalty case in Lyon County. Lyon County is a small county, what, eight, 10,000 people. We tried that there in Lyon County. It was a death penalty case. The defendant was being evaluated. He was Looney Tunes. There wasn't any question about it in my book. He was Looney Tunes. We had the psychiatric reports. The psychiatric reports were being filed with the response to discovery in the public file in the circuit clerk's office. Well, the local paper didn't care. But the Courier Journal was snooping around, and they did, and they started putting this in the Courier Journal. That didn't bother me too bad, because there weren't anybody reading the Courier Journal in Lyon County anyway. It really wasn't going to affect getting my jury there. But what happens? The local people are not going to be outdone. They take it, and they start splattering on the local Lyon County Herald Leader, Herald Ledger paper. Well, now they're really contaminating my jury pool. It's going to, they're, Lyon County, they're picking up the paper, and they're saying, this guy, is crazy. How am I going to be able to get people to come in here and be fair and objective when they bring in experts to say he's not crazy? So I told the clerk, I did a gag order, you seal these documents that are coming in from these, in, these psychiatric reports. And I sealed them, and the Cure Journal sued me, said we want them unsealed, we want to see them. And I had to go to court. And uh, I got my good friend Tom Osborne some of y'all may know, was a good friend of mine, lawyer. He represented me with that charge, and we went to court. They went to court in the Court of Appeals, petition of prohibition, make me unseal those things. Well, I hate to say this, but we compromised. I wish I'd just put him on the spot and said, you make a decision. I run my court or you run it. But we, we agreed with the Courier Journal that they would not publish uh, anything that they see in there. So we opened them up, they were able to see it, but and they were true to their word, and we were true to our word. But that's a good example. That wasn't social media. That was legitimate media. And that's been a clash for years and years and years. We've been dealing with it, especially the Toronto judge. How much do you put in the local paper? The media will say uh, they would go on that First Amendment, the people's right to know. And it's true. They have a right to know. But there's a balance there is uh, when the right to know does clash with due process. So, yeah, social media makes it even more so, makes it even more tougher to get a jury. We're, we're probably going to see more and more of that. Tracy. Okay, take out the microphone, Tracy, because I can't. Oh, no, and this is for my classes, I think, and me. I'd like to know your opinion of whether there was Native American influence on that Constitution. You know, I have my little stories about that. And I, I guess the, the foundation... Okay, let me back up. Was, it, was there any me? influence by who? The Native Americans, various ones who attended... On the making of the U.S. Constitution? And, and then I wanted to throw into that mix that in the 1600s, you know, the first American colleges, at least six of them, were here to educate the clergy and Indians. So we had, you know, when you're saying we're the place where religion thrived, 
I, I feel that mix. You know, we had the most educated men were Indians and the clergy. And so those are going to become, you know, those important politicians and their grandfathers and great-grandfathers. What do you think? Is there any I think I think what, from what I've seen and read, I mean, I think we have protected them the same as uh, anybody else in their religious rights. In fact, you may have read in the paper a couple of years ago, we had a couple of inmates down there on death row. They changed their religion to some Indian religion, and they wanted a sweat lodge. They're on death row. You know what we got? We gave them a sweat lodge. So I think we've been pretty sensitive to it. We may not have been sensitive to them in many other ways. Was, was that, did I answer your question? Now, as far as the, in, okay, the influence on the Constitution at the convention. Well, they were Christians. You know, the, the ones who were visiting and who were friends with Ben Franklin and who wanted to see how we got this done, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are a lot of little antidotes, but some of them, again, recorded by Madison of the various Indian visitors who, who tried to get them, you know, to, to just stay on track. You know, you're doing the right thing, but... Um, the Iroquois League of the Confederacy was an unwritten document at the time that Franklin always claimed is what our Constitution was based on. So mm -hmm. I need to read more. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you w wondering what kind of recognition, if any, the, the men in 1787 gave to rights for Native Americans? that it was just so obvious to them that that was a big part of what made the difference. You know, that's a doctrine. good question. And you know, they really don't deal with it very much from what I've read. Yeah. Of course, at that time, we only had 13 colonies, and the West had not been explored nor settled. So who knew that it was going to, all of those issues were going to come. But we have, I mean, today, I, I've gone to conferences and uh, the Native American reservations all have their own court system. I have a friend who's a chief justice of the Supreme Court of Arizona, Indian tribes, separate and apart from the other. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Kimberly Dossett, and I served in the Air Force for 10 years. Thank you for your service. And I'm just concerned still about the lack of diversity um, even in the present economic situation. For example, President Trump has no women, no minorities on health care decisions, and I just wondered what your opinion was with the lack of diversity still in 2017 as opposed to the 1700s. Thank you. Well, we have a lot more diversity now than we did in 1787. Um, as I said a while ago, half of half our law school classes are women. Um, we definitely have diversity in a lot of one more place where we don't have a diversity in the legal profession in West Kentucky. We have no black lawyers. We have no black lawyers, or maybe one or two. This has been a concern for, my, for me ever since I've been on the Supreme Court. Why don't we have any black lawyers down here? We have Audrey Lee and maybe one or two others. And I've talked to many, many people, including... Um, um, name slips in now, district judge, a black district judge in Hopkinsville, and he says that um, uh, they don't come back. I had a young man, an outstanding young man, black, uh, from here in McCracken County, he interned for me one summer, I begged him to come back. Um, so that's a, like, so what, why don't we? Well, and how do we change it. In my opinion, you change it by creating some kind of environment early that makes them want to be a policeman, that makes them want to be a lawyer. You got, they got, you know, you can't, I don't think you can very well go out and say, we're going to give free tuition to all blacks so they can get more lawyers. You've got to maintain the quality. So what we did, here's something y'all can help us on. We went into high schools that have high minorities, Paducah Tillman, Christian County, Hopkinsville, and established law clubs. And when we established those law clubs, we told the, the, the sponsor, look, we can't tell you to go out and get black kids in here, but that's what we want. We want to get minorities involved. We want to get them involved at, at when they're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, when they're in high school, and they see mentors come in. Well, I'll, bring in I'll bring in black judges. 
from Louisville if I have to, to set this example. So it's for law enforcement, probation, pro, corrections, and lawyers. And we haven't done very well with that. Uh, I don't know whether we came down here, came down here several times. I don't know if Tillman still has a law club or not. Hopkinsville High School had the first law, school, law club in high school in Kentucky. They had a young sponsor over there, did great. He had about 40, 50% minority in that club. He got the sheriff to provide a van. They went to, uh, to Louisville when the KBA had Sandra Day O'Connor there. She spent 15, 20 minutes of FaceTime with these. He took them to Washington, D.C., took them to Frankfurt for, for a uh, tour. Did a great job. That's hard work. And so I'm not, am I answering your question? I'm telling you what, well, I'm telling you I'm concerned about it, but I'm not sure what we can do about it except to establish that early years. Yes, sir. And I, I think it's more about, you know, outside of the state of Kentucky, I feel, and, and with all due respect, I feel like white men are still making a majority of the decisions for our, our country. And I was just wondering how can, you know, we have more females or underprivileged or minorities on cabinet, you know, Mr. Trump, from the top, well, I guess. Well, the, the females are doing better as far as the court system is concerned and the criminal justice doing better than the blacks. Uh, when I was circuit judge, uh, Caldwell County and Tree County has a high black population. I wasn't getting any black jurors. You know, we go down the black section of town, we're busting these young 18, 19 year old kids for, for drug trafficking and when all they're doing, they're going out and getting it and they come bringing it back and giving it who's buying and they get a bite of it. They come in the courtroom and they look out there and they see nothing but white faces. And they get five years or they get two years, whatever they get. The, it, it's nothing to say about whether these, all these white faces are doing justice. Now, I think they are, but the perception is not good. So I called Frankfurt and I said, I'm not getting any black jurors in Caldwell and Tree County. Why not? They said, we don't know. We said, we draw those from the driver's license list and voter registration. That was then, now it includes property. Uh, he said, you might go check your voter registration. That was when voter registration was, you could you, you put down what race you were. I don't think you do that anymore. I went to the county court clerks in those two counties. Black registration was abysmal. I mean, it was almost, it was shocking to me. They weren't registering to vote, and therefore they weren't getting on the jury list. So I went to some black friends of mine. I went to Genesis Express in Tree County, a great mentoring uh, group of African Americans. I went to a, a mentor, prominent minister there in Princeton. I said, "We got to do some. We got to do some registration. We got to get you registered. If they don't vote a vote, that's fine, but we at least can get them in juries." We weren't very successful. Uh, we weren't, and that's hard. That's the heavy lifting that people need to be doing. That's the heavy lifting our black leaders need to be doing. Going out here in Paducah, it's not hard to register people to vote. You get the, uh, it used to not be hard. I don't know if it's changed. You just get the cards at county court clerk's office. You go around, put in the information. Isn't that right, Tracy? But it takes Saturday afternoons going door to door. And once we get them registered, then we try to get them to vote. But at least they're going to show up uh, in our jury pool. So it's not good. I mean, we'll, it's just uh, we're working at it. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. One last question. What does the term a living constitution mean? A living constitution. Okay, this is what it means. What does the term a living constitution? You had Justice Scalia, he believed in interpreting the constitution according to 1787. What did it mean in 1787? That was before computers. It was before electricity, it was for motor vehicles, it was, a, as I just got through telling you a while ago, different time age. Can we interpret the Constitution the way people may interpret it in 1787? Some people like Justice Scalia says, yes, that's exactly the way we interpret it. It seems a little brittle to me. Um, I'm not sure. If we not interpret the Interstate Commerce Clause in a way that they did during the Warren Court, we may never got uh, the uh, integration laws passed that we might get. Other people say, no, it's organic or living, which means 
be adopted at the time. What does this mean, freedom of religion? What does it mean? Well, I'll give you a good example. How about a freedom of speech? It says Congress should make no law. How about pornography? Justice Hugo Black, the U.S. Supreme Court said, it says no law. It says no law. And he said that it protects pornography. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court through the years, and our state Supreme Court, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't really work very well with pornography. We, we think that's really injurious to our young. We think that we can pass laws protecting our children on the police power of the state against pornography. That's a living constitution. That's an organic constitution. You're interpreting it according to the times. I, I don't know. They may have had pornography in 1787. Probably did, but it wasn't the social problem it is today. Um, and and we, we can give it's the freedom of speech. Oliver Wendell Holmes made that classic statement, freedom of speech does not give you the right to yell falsely fire in a crowded theater. So that's the living, con that's the organic. It says this, what did it mean in 1787? It may very well have meant no laws. You cannot pass no laws, not even against pornography. We don't know. But we know today pornography is a big problem. And we know today that the children need to be protected. So. We don't have to change. That's one reason we still got our Constitution. I'm convinced the reason we're still living on this Constitution that was written in 1787 when the heart largest city in the United States was 43,000 people is because it has been a living Constitution. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Ken, how you doing? Judge, this isn't a question, but after you discussed in our Constitution and everything, you know, I just wonder if a lot of people stop and think, I know I do once in a while, about our people and our country. Like, for our relatives that came from other parts of this country and established the area that they have here. You know, just think of all them people, what hardships they had to go through. I mean, people from Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, come west. And I know a lot of people here have people that have come that way. And just think of all the hardship that they have endured to get over here and to make this country for everybody. Everybody. That's exactly right. Everybody in this room comes from stock that is hard hardship. And you know with the, you know the people that I talk to and uh, you know, the historians and I've met a lot of guys and they, they were they were they were educators and you know who they are you know who they are yes thank you thank you other questions thank you for uh, listening to me you know if you lose money by being here today Amy's going to reimburse you <laughs> but nobody can reimburse you for the time that you've lost sorry about that thank you well I don't know about reimbursing you, but I am glad you were here today. And I want to say a special thank you, thank you to Justice Cunningham for coming and doing this. It was very interesting, and I really enjoyed it. And as a token of our appreciation, I have two books written by our very own Director of Public Relations, Janet Blythe. One is Upward Stride, and the other is The Formative Years. And it gives you the history of WKCTC and Paducah Junior College, and all of that is in there. So... Being the historian that you are, I thought you might appreciate that. I appreciate that. that. I'm going to put a plug in for this school here, this college, in West Kentucky Community College. First time I've been on campus in many, many years. And boy, it's nice. And you've really grown a lot, and I'm really proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Good leadership. Tremendous leadership here in Marvin Jeezy. And I understand the new president. Dr. Anton. Dr. 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 Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you didn't get refreshments, there are plenty of refreshments over there. We'd sure love for you to have some.